Hello, my name is Victor Zberstis, and I'm on the team working behind the scenes on worldcommunitygrid.org, which has been harvesting spare processing time from computers, tablets, and smartphones around the world since 2004, putting these computing devices to good use while they would otherwise be consuming electrical power just waiting for that next keystroke or mouse movement. One of the research projects on World Community Grid is the Discovered Dengue Drugs Project from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, Texas. Please let me introduce Dr. Stan Wadowich, who will give you an overview and update of this project. Victors, thank you very much. I am delighted to be here online with both you, the IBM team, and members of the World Community Grid. So I welcome you all, and again, I'm delighted to be here. So let's begin. And what I want to lead you through today is a little bit of background on why we started this project on World Community Grid and how it uh, dovetails into a larger effort that we're involved in looking at better ways of developing and discovering new drugs. So initially, if we look at the landscape of infectious diseases, which is an area of research in my laboratory, we notice that pathogens, the agents, the bugs, the microbes responsible for infectious disease, cause a fair bit of problems around the world. It's estimated that about 25% of all deaths that occur in the world are due to a pathogen. And again, a pathogen could be a bacteria, it could be a parasitic agent, it could be a virus. And some of the viruses that uh, we are familiar with are things like HIV, hepatitis C or HCV, where we believe that about 3% of the entire world, everyone in the world, might be seropositive. I see we have about um, 40 people on the line, so unfortunately it could mean that one of the 40 uh, might be seropositive. And then we have a disease that we have been working on called dengue, which is caused by a virus called remarkably enough, dengue virus. And it's estimated that there are upwards of two to 400 million infections a year. Now, fortunately, many of those infections are benign, such that of the 200 to 400 million infections, typically in a year, somewhere between two and perhaps as many as 20 million people actually are sick enough that they go into a clinic. So that's the landscape globally, and even in the United States, for those listeners online uh, from the U.S. or, or, or Canada, um, we find that uh, viral diseases cause about 5% of U.S. deaths. And again, the major culprits in this case would be HIV again, HCV, and influenza, which year in, year out, even without a, a particular epidemic, still are responsible for between... 30,000 and 50,000 deaths. And so the question becomes, given the fact that infectious diseases impact human health and mortality quite a bit around the world, how do you combat them? Well, one of the key ways to combat an infectious disease is simple public health measures, simply hand washing. We've been seeing those campaigns now quite extensively to try to limit the spread of uh, shall we say, microbes. Another very effective mechanism is vaccines. And I suspect everyone on this uh, chat uh, has had a number of vaccines, uh, which are a spectacular way to protect yourself against an infectious disease. But unfortunately, there are a number of agents out there that we haven't figured out a vaccine for them or we don't have adequate public health measures and some of the common ones tuberculosis comes to mind african sleeping sickness and our old favorite dengue now people are working on vaccines for dengue but we're also trying to find drugs to uh, combat or stop the infection once one gets uh, the virus in them and so that's where our lab is uh, focusing some of its efforts on. And so as we look at this disease, it uh, might be worthwhile to remind people, because this is a disease most citizens of the U.S. have never run across unless they travel to some tropical or subtropical regions of the world. But dengue disease impacts about 40% of the world. And it is a nasty disease if you actually get sick. You get a high fever, in the kind of the typical disease case, a high fever, 
headache, muscle pain. And in that case, uh, the people I've never had it, fortunately, but the people who I've talked to who have it um, just say you feel like you want to die for about a week or two because your joints are in excruciating pain and, and hence it's been termed break bone fever where you do feel like someone is breaking your bones it's that painful and unfortunately then that's the simplest disease part of uh, what dengue could cause it can lead to a more serious disease called hemorrhagic fever where you have the above symptoms but then you start hemorrhaging also so that's not too pleasant and that can then lead to shock and ultimately death so that's what the disease looks like, and the question then becomes, who uh, comes across this disease? Well, like I mentioned, it's estimated that about 40% of the world's at risk for being infected by this virus. This virus is spread by a mosquito, so you're bitten by a mosquito. During that blood meal that the mosquito takes, it deposits the virus into you. You will now have the virus in you, another mosquito comes along, will suck your blood, that mosquito now picks up the virus and goes delivers it to another uh, human. And so that's the cycle, it's mosquito to human to mosquito to human, and it occurs throughout the tropics, as you can see on this map, um, such that we see upwards of 400 million infections. But again, as I mentioned, luckily many of these infections are benign, uh, so that we may see only a few million cases of dengue fever and maybe half a million cases of dengue hemorrhagic or shock symptoms. So if you look at the map, you think, well, if I live in the U.S., life is good. If I live in Canada, life is good as far as getting this disease. And by and large, that's true. Unfortunately, though, in the last few years, there have been uh, recent outbreaks occurring in Miami, in Dade County, and now in Houston along the Texas-Mexico border. Um, we are seeing some outbreaks. So the disease and the vectors, the mosquitoes uh, spreading the disease, are slowly moving north. They'll never make it to Canada. That's a little too cold up there. But in this tropical and subtropical regions of the world, that's where you'll find the disease. And it'll also impact you if you start traveling to these regions. So that's the disease we're trying to develop drugs for. And then the question becomes, you know, let give you a little background on what's involved in developing drug. So we're all used to going to the supermarket, the pharmacy, and picking up a drug and saying, okay, well, I'll just take this pill and, and life will be good for whatever uh, my disease is. But we, if we step back and say, well, how did these compounds, how do these drugs that we pick up so cavalierly at the pharmacy, how do they develop? It looks like a very challenging process. And there are a number of steps in the U.S., that are required that you have to go through in order to even get a drug in the marketplace. And so we liken it to kind of climbing a mountain where the easy part is identifying the disease you want to tackle, them. and that's what we've just discussed. The almost as easy as what we call lead discovery, finding a molecule, a small molecule, that impacts the disease in the laboratory. That's actually considered relatively easy, but that's what we've been working on. Then after that is to show that it works in animals, and not only works in animals, but it has good distribution throughout the animal, a good mechanism of delivering it to the animal, so that you can use all that information and show some safety in animals. In other words, you want your compound to work against your disease, but also to be safe. You want to collect all this data, and then you have to go to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., show them all your data, and get permission to actually begin a test or an experiment with humans to see whether or not your compound that you were so excited by when you tested it in the laboratory actually has the expected effect and safety profile in humans. And that's what we call these clinical trials, and they're divided typically up into phases one through four. So that's the landscape of what's involved in actually trying to uh, develop a drug. And this process can take easily up to 10, 15, 20 years if it works at all. So it's a very challenging long-term proposition. Not only is it challenging and long-term, it's really inefficient because we estimate that of a thousand molecules that we might find to begin efficacy testing kind of right at the beginning of this mountain, of those thousand, one might actually become a drug. So this is a very difficult, challenging process that we're facing with. 
And so the challenges uh, for people who want to develop new drugs to cure a disease, labs like ourselves and, and most of the pharmaceutical industry, is how do you actually develop drugs w when you're looking at diseases that impact the developing world? In other words, it's not a big, perhaps a really big market place or a profit to be made. So you have very limited resources that you can apply to actually develop a drug. And so that's why we turn to the World Community Grid to say, can we use some of their resources to help um, us in our efforts? And then the question is, if these resources are valuable for us, can we then make them available to researchers in the developing world to help them find drugs for diseases that impact them? So that's, those are the challenges we're looking at. And so the approach we're going to take with this, since it's World Community Grid and, and we're using computers, we're going to be using, obviously, what we call computer-based drug discovery. So we're using a process called computer-based drug discovery, and, and conceptually it looks like this. We identify this thing on the uh, right-hand side of the screen that we call a protein target. So a part of the microbe that we believe we can stop from working. So that's the first thing, is we need to find part of the microbe that we want to prevent from doing its job. And we want to find a small molecule that will bind to this protein target so that we stop the protein target from doing whatever its job is. Okay. So on the computer, what we can do is we can load into your computers, into my computers, this ligand library. And this, these are millions and millions of small molecules that we've virtualized and put on the computer. In addition, we load onto the computer a target protein. And the goal now is to use a program, a computer docking program, to see which of the small molecules in our library, which of the millions of small molecules, will actually fit into the protein target and be predicted to stop it from working. So we make a complex, and that's showing this big yellow thing. So the green would be the molecule that has been predicted to bind. The yellow would be the protein target. And the computer program then calculates how those two are going to interact and how strong that interaction is. And then the computer will return to us a list of what it predicts to be the best small molecules to accomplish this binding. And then obviously we have to go ahead and test to see whether or not the computer predictions are correct. So backing up a second, the question becomes then, is there a druggable target, a protein target in the dengue virus that we can look to stop from functioning? And so if we look at in this slide here, we have kind of the genome of the virus. It's a very simple genome. It's comprised of looking at about eight different proteins. And we've targeted a protein called the protease, circled in red. And this protein is responsible for cutting up the other proteins of the virus into workable segments. And we've shown, we and other labs have shown, that if the protease doesn't work properly, the virus can't replicate. So essentially, if you can stop the protease, you stop the virus. And so we know the structure of the protease, so we can take that structure and use that as our protein target, and that's what we've done. So we've taken structures of the dengue protease, combined it with the ligand libraries, sent it all off to World Community Grid members, and gave them a docking program such that we can start trying to find ligands that are going to fit in the protein target and make these complexes. And that's basically what the Discovering Dengue Drugs Together project is. And we ran this website and we ran this for a couple years. We targeted 15 different proteins. Several of them were variants of dengue. Some of them were West Nile, which is a close uh, relative to dengue. Hepatitis C we also targeted. We used a molecular library of 2.3 million compounds and it took us for phase one about 12,000 CPU years. And so after all that work was done, we ran a phase two. But the upshot is, from all of that work, um, we got back a list of compounds. And in this case, we're showing three different variants of dengue, slightly different structures, all the protease structures slightly different. And the, the Venn diagram, so if you look at the red for the particular structure we targeted, we found that the computer predicted 60 small molecules should bind tightly and, and stop that protease from working. For a variant of that structure, let's say the blue 
part of the uh, Venn diagram in the lower right corner there were 65 small molecules and in the lower uh, left corner in that green there were 51 small molecules that the computer predicted so all in all for the various dengue proteases that we targeted um, the computer was predicting on the order of about 160 small molecules and very little overlap almost no overlap between the molecules predicted so that one would say well that's good if we have 165 molecules that can be serve as the beginnings of a drug the bad part is of all of those when we actually tested them in the lab only five of them actually worked in the laboratory as far as stopping the protease from doing its job so what we found is that this is a very and we knew this and a very inefficient uh, process because you have to do a lot of testing it took us a long time to finish the testing to only come up with a few compounds and so the predictions aren't very good we tried phase two of the dengue project to develop some software to improve the predictions um, in small scale tests in our own lab that software and the program looked very effective when we actually brought it out into the real world and ran it on the on the grid against much larger data sets we found that um, the programs weren't actually effective so we're back to the drawing board to find a better program to try to improve the efficiency of the uh, software screening and so where we are where we are right now is we have some compounds based on our screening and these are shown in kind of the middle here um, and we're showing some properties of these and as you can see green means that the property matches what we want for a drug candidate red means that it doesn't and so we have on the far left hand side column various attributes of what a drug might look like how big it is its molecular weight how soluble it is etc etc how it works in the in a cell uh, what's the maximum dose that can be tolerated in an animal and so a drug candidate has various properties and we compare those properties with what our lead has and we can see that we have some good properties but by and large most of the properties of our leads don't match where we want the drug candidate so what we're in the process of doing now is making small modifications to our leads so that we can move them more into the drug candidate uh, profile and this optimization could easily take one two three years it may never happen um, that's certainly possible, but we're optimistic. We're making progress in matching, modifying our leads so they look more like drug candidates. And we hope then in about three to four years to actually begin going to the FDA so that we can start clinical trials on something that looks like a drug candidate. So I want to thank the members of the World Community Grid for volunteering and there are an amazingly large number of them over 175,000 individuals donated computer time to our phase one and phase two efforts the IBM team was outstanding in helping to put this project together and so we couldn't uh, make this progress to begin along the drug uh, development path without uh, the world community grid uh, computers and the IBM team helping uh, this project. In addition, we have members in the lab, on our campus, collaborators, chemists, uh, and a number of other campuses, a uh, team at uh, the Texas Advanced Computer Center. So all of these groups contribute their efforts and time to begin the drug development process. But uh, I want to reiterate, this is just the beginning of a very long, difficult climb to actually get a compound that may be effective against dengue. So I want to thank you very much for your, your help on this effort, and we'll be continuing. And with that, I'll uh, open it up and send it back to Victor's. Thank you, Dr. Iwanowicz, for this informative talk about the Discover Dengue Drugs Together project and how our idle computer time has helped with the fight against a number of diseases through worldcommunitygrid.org. We hope those listening are contributing and will encourage their friends to also contribute their spare computing power by joining worldcommunitygrid.org. We have time for a few questions. Our first question is, um, what diseases are called flaviviruses? Okay, so flavivirus, it's a family called flaviviridae, and these are single-stranded RNA uh, viruses, and they look very much they look very much like this genome shown here. So this actually is a uh, the protein uh, that's encoded by the genome. But by and large, the flaviviruses have 
this type of genetic makeup. And some of the ones that one would be familiar with, if we think of dengue as, as uh, a key member, then a very close uh, relative to dengue, or one would call it almost a, a, um, a first cousin, would be West Nile virus, and that uh, we are well aware of in, in uh, the U.S. right now. This causes uh, several thousand uh, clinical cases each, each year right now. Other viruses would be Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever virus, and then very, very distantly related but still part of the Flaviviridae family would be hepatitis C virus. Now, the hepatitis C virus is a, is a blood-borne virus. It's passed by blood contact, whereas the other flaviviruses that we talked about, uh, which would be called the flavi, it's actually called flaviviruses as opposed to flaviviridae, are, are passed by mosquitoes and ticks. So, can all these virus, uh, viruses be stopped by disabling the same protease? Yes. So in all in all cases, this and the protease is a little bit different in in hepatitis C, but the good thing is uh, there are two drugs that just entered the market last year that specifically stop the protease of hepatitis C from working, and in, and those now are marketable drugs, and they're being used to help uh, treat people who have chronic hepatitis C infections. So we know in that case of a kind of a distant uh, fourth cousin, if you will. Uh, to the dengue virus, that this approach of targeting the protease, stopping it from working, uh, is very effective. And so these other flaviviruses, we believe quite strongly that this approach will, will also work. If another disease uh, was similar to dengue, could part of the results be shared uh, to reduce the testing time? Sure. Another disease? And, and so we've been fortunate in that the molecules that we found, have found in our lab that stop the dengue protease from working, also stop the protease from West Nile virus from working. And so we have the same compound that we can use so far to prevent replication of uh, dengue virus and prevent replication of West uh, Nile virus. We haven't had the time or the resources to check whether or not it also will prevent replication of yellow fever virus or say, shall we say, Japanese encephalitis virus. We have another question. Where does your funding come from, and is this funding exclusively for diseases in the developing world? So the funding comes from several sources. It comes from the NIH. Uh, some funding has come from the IBM International Foundation. There's a foundation in Texas called the Welsh Foundation, and there's a philanthropic organization called the uh, Dunn Foundation, which has partnered with the, what we call the Gulf Coast Consortium. And these various funding sources have all graciously supported our research into finding cures for dengue disease. Was the autodoc portion of the project not as successful as you would have liked? Uh, definitely. Um, we, we knew that going in from pilot studies. We knew that to have the predictions be correct with the autodoc for this particular target protease, um, very, very low probability. And that's where we were hoping phase two, we could take thousands and thousands of compounds from phase one that we wouldn't be able to test in the laboratory for lack of resources and use the phase two to, to really find out of those thousands which ones should we focus our efforts on. So we knew going into it that the phase one would likely not be overly successful. The idea was to use phase two to improve the success rate. And what we find, and, what, and this is well known in the field, is that different uh, docking programs, Autodoc or Vena or Doc, etc., uh, seem to have different rates of success for different proteins. And so there are some cases where you might run a docking program against a particular program and find that the predictions that 50% of them work out in the laboratory. In other cases, you may use the same program with a different protein and find that, you know, you might look at a thousand predictions and none of them work out in the laboratory. So the programs are very uh, protein specific and we're hoping with the phase two to eliminate some of that protein specific bias and uh, certainly that, that hasn't come to pass quite yet. Is there an explanation for why the charm screening in the second phase of the project was not as successful? 
We have several uh, avenues we're pursuing to try to understand that. One is uh, these programs are highly dependent on understanding the electrostatics of the system, understanding the motions, because um, these proteins are always uh, in movement, they're always vibrating in, in solution, and so we're looking a little harder at how the dynamics of the protein uh, behaves, what sort of time scales we need to uh, run the uh, computer simulations for, what to do about uh, uh, modeling the water in these systems, and again, how to uh, modify the electrostatics and whether or not we need to start uh, perturbing the electrostatics as molecules bind. So these are some of the areas that we're pursuing as we uh, continue these simulations. Have you tried using Vena against uh, dengue or the related diseases? Yes, and Vena certainly um, for dengue works a lot better than Autodoc, and so that's where we've turned our attention now in our own lab to using uh, the Vena program. In fact, we've um, Vena runs has two advantages for for our work. One, it runs faster than Autodoc, and two, it has better uh, uh, success rates for our particular proteins. And so because it runs faster, we've actually ported it to uh, the Texas Advanced Computer Center, and we're running Vena screens um, on the supercomputer there. And unfortunately, um, it doesn't require quite the computer resources um, that the Autodoc portion did, and so we actually don't need the World Community Grid to get that same amount of work done. But it's definitely something, if, if we were to scale up the project, we may uh, look at Vena on World Community Grid. And I believe you do have Vena running on World Community Grid on another project, if I, if I remember correctly. Yes, we do. Yep. Uh, which of the flavor viruses have vaccines and which ones have antiviral treatments? No flaviviruses that I'm aware of have antiviral treatments other than hepatitis C. Uh, vaccines, we have uh, no vaccines for dengue. There are, they are in phase 2 slash 3 clinical trials in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand, for instance. And so we'll see how those develop. There is a vaccine for yellow fever. There's a vaccine for for Japanese encephalitis. There are some uh, vaccines that aren't approved in the U.S. for a uh, flavivirus called tick-borne encephalitis. And that's, uh, you, see, you find that more in uh, parts, parts of, uh, some parts of Russia. And so there's some uh, small vaccine amounts available for people who live in those endemic uh, regions. Are there uh, drug-resistant strains, you know, drug-resistant to the vaccines or uh, antivirals for hepatitis C now? In the laboratory, we can generate uh, drug resistance, not we, but the researchers working on it, can generate resistance strains to the hepatitis C protease inhibitors. That's definitely quite true. Uh, the vaccine strains, we're not seeing large uh, cases of resistance developing yet. Um, for those. But that is certainly the problem when you're dealing with an RNA virus. An RNA virus has a propensity to, to mutate, and so the worry is that any um, treatment, the virus will eventually just mutate around it. Now we're looking at the active site of the protease, in our case, is, is highly conserved, and any mutations there seem to be deleterious to the virus function. And so that may extend the time it takes for the virus to find a evolutionary pathway to develop resistance. It's still going to eventually happen. And so that's why when you look at HIV, um, it's necessary to have several drugs uh, being taken simultaneously so that you really slow down the emergence of, of resistance. But even in that case, you still will find over long periods of time the beginnings of um, multi-drug resistant uh, strains of uh, HIV emerging. So we are aware that this is a serious problem out there. So that's why other people are looking at some of the other proteins of the dengue and, and trying to develop drugs against uh, those proteins so that uh, the hope would be that we could get a cocktail of dengue drugs to really uh, reduce the uh, emergence of, of resistant strains. Well, thanks again, Dr. Wadowich, and those attending. Sorry if we didn't get to your question. Please use our forums at worldcommunitygrid.org to post any additional questions. 
This concludes our webcast.